With the Biden regime's incompetence clogging supply lines, now's the time to check out this offer from preparewithdronetech.com. These days, the future is still more uncertain than ever. That's why people who know what's coming are using today to prepare. You can't wait until the last moment. By then, it's too late. The most important thing you need is long-term storage emergency food. And saving $50 is impossible to pass up, but supplies are limited. So go to www.preparewithdronetech.com right now and stock up. That's preparewithdronetech.com. There's no time to lose. Do it now. Well, go ahead and add comedy to the list of historic American institutions under attack by the DCP also known as the Democratic Communist Party. As we all know, it's been a steadily building movement on the left for several years now, with one of the most recent victims being Dave Chappelle in his new stand-up movie on Netflix. On that note, surprisingly, Netflix made the right decision and stood behind Dave Chappelle, actually firing the activists who wanted him censored. The right decision to be sure, but that doesn't make up for dear white people and cuties, so I probably still won't be subscribing to them anytime soon. So today we have the far left magazine, The Atlantic, who published an interview with a writer from a massively popular new satire site called The Babylon Bee. I'm sure you've all heard of it. If you're not familiar with it, it's like The Onion, except for their focus is on the left and Democrats. Which is a really important thing to have in this day and age, since in the current authoritarian environment, mocking Democrats could be seen as domestic terrorism. So it's no surprise that this communist writer over at The Atlantic, Emma Green, has a real problem understanding what's funny about mocking Democrats. So as these political posts have started to go viral, they have gotten a lot of criticism for pushing satire past the line of making jokes and into misinformation. So with my reporting, I spend a lot of time in the evangelical world that the Babylon Bee inhabits. And I wanted to know directly from them, what do they think they're doing when they're telling these jokes? Yeah, who do they think they are making fun of Democrats? Like, they can't do that in America, right? So I called the editor-in-chief of the Babylon Bee, Kyle Mann. Well, I'm not going to explain the joke to you. Do you want me to explain the joke to you? Yes! Because the, <laughs> the joke is that... Humor is this weird thing where either you think it's funny or you don't. Either you see it as a joke or you don't. This is just so painful to listen to because this is a person who clearly is not used to being challenged on their beliefs. And they really look down on anybody who disagrees with them because in their circles, they get patted on the back for having certain points of view that they don't really think through very thoroughly. Atlantic writer Emma Green sits down with Kyle Mann, the editor-in-chief of the Babylon Bee, to talk about Christianity, and common. But it's not just people on the left who misinterpret Babylon B articles. There are also plenty of people on the right who read these headlines and just think they're news. Take, for example, this article that was published in January of 2020. It was shared 3.3 million times, according to the numbers that are on the B's website. The headline was, Democrats call for flags to be flown at half-mast to grieve the death of Soleimani. That, of course, is Qasem Soleimani, the Iranian leader who was killed in an American strike. Like, I want to know, what makes this funny? I know that's the worst question for somebody to ask to somebody who writes jokes, but, like, why is that funny? Oh, yeah. Why is that funny to make fun of us Democrats? Why is that funny? It's just so pathetic. And it just, let's see where this goes. Well, it's funny because General Soleimani died. And then they called for flags to be flown at half mast to grieve his death. Get it? But that's what I'm saying. Like, what, what, besides just saying the joke over, what makes it funny? Well, I'm not going to explain the joke to you. Do you want me to explain the joke to you? Yes. Because the, <laughs> the joke is that General Soleimani died and Democrats were sad. But why is that funny? If you don't know why that's funny, then you're not the audience for the joke. <laughs> Exactly, man. This is just painful because it's clear to everybody what the joke is. I mean, this goes back to when Trump was still president and he took out this terrorist general. The media reacted just like you would predict they'd react because Trump did something good. So they had to somehow spin it as bad. And it manifested with all these so-called news agencies that we know are Democrat state media describing Soleimani in these sort of soaringly positive statements and using language like, 
Quote, he was an austere scholar. I actually did a video on this topic, uh, ironically, right around this time a couple years ago. And it was all about how the media was seemingly taking the side of this terrorist general just because he's enemies with Trump. So the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So the video has a Halloween theme. You should go check it out when you're done with this video. The joke is that lefties and Democrats rally behind really bad people when they happen to have the same enemies, even if those enemies are simply fellow Americans who disagree with them. And the media and Democrats get away with it. But as this fragile little porcelain doll sees it, they're just spreading misinformation using liberal stereotypes. I think what's tough about this joke is that on the one hand, there are conservatives who would read this headline and not give it a second thought. They would think that it's real because it exactly fits all of the stereotypes and cliches that people on the right use about the left all the time. You see, this is the typical trait that we see on the left, where they're just incapable of making fun of themselves, incapable of self-reflection or self-awareness. And we know this because satire making fun of the right or Republicans is way more prevalent in the mainstream media. You're not trying to tell a joke. You're trying to mislead people. There's no shared kernel of truth. There's nothing that people from different political perspectives could look and say, hey, I actually see something a little bit true about the joke that you're trying to tell. But obviously, Kyle disagrees. <laughs> the funniest part about that is that it got fact-checked because it was so believable that Democrats would do that. And so that's the funniest part to me. I don't think the reason that they fact-checked it was because it was so plausible. I think it's because it was being shared millions of times on Facebook. Millions of times on Facebook? This woman has one of those really obnoxious valley girl, spoiled brat kind of accents. I mean, are we to believe that satire against Republicans isn't shared widely across Facebook and Twitter? Of course it does, and without fact checks. But you can just tell from the annoying inflections in this woman's voice that she's just mad that people are allowed to mock her viewpoints. And but why was that? It was because it was plausible. <laughs> yeah, but so, OK, what if people did believe that was real, which I think they gathered evidence that some people thought that was real. Do you worry about that, that people, regardless of how many times you, you know, make it clear that you're a satire website or whatever, that people will read that and be like, oh, this is actually a fact that I saw. I'm a boomer, you know, scrolling through my Facebook feed. <laughs> I actually think that this is a real thing that Democrats do. It's just I mean, does she worry about this happening on, say, The Onion, where they make fun of re Republicans regularly, or SNL, or The Daily Show, or Steve Colbert? Of course not. This is a completely one-sided worry that she has. She's not even considering that this is a problem on her side, which it's not a problem at all. This is a completely manufactured problem to use as justification to censor mockery of her ideas. That pose any ethical responsibilities for you guys like i mean not any more so than any other comedian who gets mistaken for being real does snl bear responsibility because people still think that sarah palin said that she could see russia from her house you can actually see russia from land here in alaska and i can see russia from my house <laughs> the onions had been shared by politicians who thought it was real Stephen Colbert, people always thought was was being serious. And you feel like you get slammed for it more because you're writing from a conservative perspective. <laughs> well, we do. You know, we've seen this time and again with fact checkers and stuff that there's a different way in which they fact check our articles and accuse us of intentionally muddying the waters, of intentionally spreading misinformation versus the way that they would fact check other sites in the past where they would say, come on, this is satire, obviously. And there's just a totally different tone in the way that they approach us. So she says to this Babel Humbee writer that he feels like he's being treated differently because he's a conservative satire writer. And I just find that hilarious that she would say that. She says that he feels that way, implying that it's not really true. It's just his paranoia. But there's a really easy way you can test this as far as she's concerned. Has she written any articles uh, having any concern for left-wing satirical news sites and uh, what they say about Republicans and the misinformation that they spread? Of course not. There is, she has not written a single article on that subject. I want to talk about one of the many drawings in your new book. There's one in particular that's at the beginning of Chapter 2, which is on race. I wonder <sighs> if you remember that particular image it has three little stick figures you remember the one i'm talking about no okay so i'll i'll just describe it to you it, it, there's it's chapter two and race is the heading and then there's a little stick figure that's like i don't know peach colored that says bad and then one that's next to it 
to the right that's gray that says better. And then there's one that's next to it to the right that says best and it's black. And I wonder, like, why do you think that's funny? (laughs) It's like, uh, this is completely mental. It's funny because left wingers, liberal media, you know, Democrats, the woke, whatever you want to call them think there's something wrong with being white. I mean, anytime somebody puts up and it's an okay to be white sign, the media erupts saying how disgusting and awful that is, which is kind of mind bending because what is wrong with saying it's okay to be white? The reason people put those signs up in the first place is because they feel like they're in an environment where it's not okay to be the skin color that they were born as. Well, it's because being peach is not good or being (laughs) yellow is not good or whatever color that is. I'm not looking at the drawing, but being gray is better and then being uh, black, being dark colored is best. Right. But you're not just talking about (laughs) that in terms of stick figures, right? Like you're talking about that in terms of how progressives think about a hierarchy of race. Right. Like she's not even arguing against it. This is what's so crazy about this to me. She she literally she knows what he's talking about, but she just finds nothing funny about mocking that mocking the idea that we're we claim to be against racism, yet. We form this racial hierarchy where we're going to put this group that we've deemed to be this horrible group of people. We're going to put them at the bottom. And uh, as you get further away from that color, it's better, which is why we have these diversity quotas where it seems like the only uh, the only real standard for diversity is just a lack of white people. You can have like a classroom full of black people or a classroom full of Latino people or Asian people. That's diverse simply because of who it is. you throw white people into that mix and suddenly it's not, you know, it's, it's lacking diversity, which is why you see like at these multicultural centers at universities, they're kicking white people out of them because as they put it at Arizona State University, white people don't have culture. And so that's what they're being taught. And that is what this Babylon Bee writer is mocking. That's the joke. So why, why is that funny? Um, well, I'm not, I'm not sitting here with a book and I'm not going to sit here and deconstruct and explain every joke to you. <laughs> I think what you're doing is you're pulling out these like singular jokes in the midst of a book that is written in this voice that says, hey, here's a guide to being woke and here's how you get there. And there's one joke that does that in the middle of a chapter on race. And the hope is that as you're sitting there reading it, we're writing in this voice and we're taking this ridiculous position in order to mock something. Right. Uh, A a guy who I think really popularized this tactic was Rush Limbaugh, who would always saying that he was trying to demonstrate absurdity by being absurd. You take this completely absurd position in an attempt to get the other people who are taking these absurd positions to get them to see how absurd it is. But instead of that, it's like they're just incapable of that sort of self-reflection. So instead of that, they just say that you're spreading misinformation. Oh, you're she, you know, she tries to make it seem like this drawing that he had was, was super nefarious. When in reality, she's removing the context. He's explaining that now. But, you know, instead of just doing some self-reflecting, instead of that, she's casting this guy as some sort of a monster and trying to justify uh, or trying to make some sort of an argument that what he's doing is somehow wrong and should be stopped. If you really don't get the joke, I, I, I don't I can't help you. <laughs> yes. Well, I guess what I'm wondering is whether you think that spirit on the left that you're trying to capture with that cartoon, do you think that that mentality is actually true to liberal or progressive subcultures in America? Yes. Well, absolutely. And obviously that's kind of an extreme example. The role of the comedian is to stand there and be the court jester and say, hey, like, what the heck are we doing with all this wokeness and cultural Marxism and to just stand there and point at it and hold up a mirror to mock it. Like it's not supposed to create this nuanced discussion and make these nuanced points. Um, Do I think everybody on the left thinks that way? No. But the second you say that in comedy, you're not making a joke anymore. Now you're just like writing a think piece. Why does it seem like explaining comedy to these uh, communists, as I call them, communist activists, Why is explaining comedy to these people like explaining comedy to an android? All right, folks, that's all I have for this one. Make sure to check out the full interview and Kyle Mann's response to it. I'll leave a link for that in the description and pinned comment. But before you go, let me know what you think in the comments.